So the, uh, I just want to place us in the flow of the story. At chapter 6, we basically got microbial life and nothing else. But the microbial life mostly exists in the ocean. And uh, it's just important to say, as a, as a chemist, you want to think about the ocean in terms of our friend, the phase diagram. So we're, we're probably going to have a question that will ha have you use a phase diagram. And one of the things that you can see is that as the Earth started, it was really hot, and then it cooled down as it radiated infrared heat out into space. So it was somewhere out here, and it was all the water was vapor when the Earth was first formed. Then it cooled down relatively quickly, just a couple, uh, couple million years, possibly even, um, definitely less than a billion. And it cooled down, and it cooled down, it cooled down. And the amazing thing about the Earth is that it cooled down and it stopped cooling down, and the planet stopped cooling down here, even though space is like cold like this. So if it equilibrated with space, it should be, uh, keep going all the way down here. But there were a number of factors that kept its temperature warmer than it should have been, warmer than most other planets. So planets like Mars lost their oceans. Venus, it boiled. Uh, so Venus kind of stayed here. Mars kind of went all the way here. We uh, ended up, actually Mars is probably down here, to tell you the truth. But we ended up nestled. It's much harder to have a planet stay in this space than it is to have it not go very far or go too far. You have to kind of like hit this part exactly because as you cool down, you have to stop right here. It's one of the things that makes our planet special. So this is what we mean. Water is constrained to be liquid at standard temperature and pressure. The standard temperature and pressure on the Earth gives us liquid water, and it happens to be right in that region. And so this is directly close to one of the special points that we had on the graph. Remember, we have the critical pressure, which is right here. And then we have the triple point that's right there. So you can summarize this as the Earth cooled toward its triple point and then stopped. It's actually not that unusual for things to cool, but it's unusual for them to stop too far up and stay warmer than they should, much warmer than the surrounding space. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this part right here. This is another little thing about, uh, about how things go together. Uh, but the, the main thing I want to say is the pattern of positive and negative charges determines what has the, 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 the form that, that has the most and least energy. Okay, so remember that these are all charges interacting and things like that. And when you have something dissolving, you have it in a lattice. So like it's surrounded by other positives and negatives. And then you break off part of it. You can have the energy of just the positive next to the negative. And then you have the energy of just the positive or just the negative surrounded by water. This is, has an energy too. You know, if, if things interact well with water, they dissolve well. If things interact better with their friends in the lattice, they stay over here. Depending on the energies, but these energies are not that mysterious. They're mostly be able to be calculated based on the charges, plus and minus, uh, and sizes of the ions. And those are determined by the periodic table. So the energy is related to the shape, and the shape is caused by the periodic table. The main thing is that you, you have predictable and reasonable solubilities as a result. The difference between how energetic it is in a lattice versus how energetic it is dissolved and surrounded by water is a solubility reaction. And so we just have a reaction that has precipitate on one side and ions on the other side. We write a, an equilibrium constant for this, uh, products over reactants, right? But what's unusual about the reactants in this case? The reactant is a pure solid. So do you remember what we do for that? That doesn't really have a concentration, right? It means that all these equilibrium constants are actually really pretty simple. They don't have a denominator. They only have a numerator because they're all divided by one. And that's why KSPs are actually simpler. Um, so I can promise you that you actually might see a KSP on the test because it's actually simpler to deal with. You only have to deal with the ions and whatever stoichiometric coefficients you have. 
So the, the thing about these, this is the, K, the K for this reaction is called the solubility product. And you can look up and down, and it's a little bit, you have to be a little bit careful not to compare apples and oranges, because the ions will, remember that you have the stoichiometry, when this dissolves, for example, it's going to make one Cu and two OHs. And the OH is going to be squared in the concentration, uh, in the equilibrium constant. So this, this number equals concentration of Cu times concentration of OH squared. That's the one thing that you can remember. But you can compare things that are similar to each other, like you can compare cobalt sulfide to copper sulfide. And if it's the K for this reaction, which of these dissolves more? Both of these have the same format, so you can compare the numbers directly. Which one of these ends up with more stuff in solution? They're both small numbers because they, they both like to be in the lattice more than they like to be surrounded by water. Yeah. You can go from the numbers because it's actually, it's roughly speaking, each of these will be like the square root of this. So the square root of 36 is 10 to the minus 18. You can do that in your, in your calculator. But here the copper concentration, if it's equal to the sulfur concentration, would be like 10 to the minus, um, 10 to the minus 18. Here it would be 10 to the minus 10. So 10 to the minus 10 is greater than 10 to the minus 18. They're both pretty darn insoluble, but you can say that the copper is super insoluble. And in fact, if you look up and down, this is one of the biggest negative exponents that you have on the whole thing. Copper sulfide is one of the most insoluble things. It does not produce products very much at all. Find me something that does produce products that is soluble. So the smaller yeah, and, and the one thing is, um, remember that we're talking about like 0.00000, the, the pro dealing with negative exponents is yeah. kind of a pain. So Uh, yes, if the number at the very end is bigger, it's more insoluble. So find something that's soluble? So find something that's more soluble than cobalt sulfide. Where are we? Okay, so a magnesium oxalate, totally. This one of the most soluble things here because it has one of the smallest numbers. That means you have relatively high numbers of ions in solution. And what did you see, Harleen? Calcium sulfate. Oh, there we are. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent one. And, uh, you know, you can do very general things like that. You can say that the ones with the smaller numbers are definitely much more soluble. And you can even be, as, as long as you're, you're careful about it, I can ask you a question, iron sulfide. Is iron sulfide more or less soluble than cobalt sulfide? You can look over here and you see the 10 to the minus 16. So that's a bigger, that, that is a, um, that will end up giving you more, and iron sulfide will be more soluble. You can roughly go up and down, and you can say the bigger the solubility product, the more, and I mean literally bigger, I'm not talking about exponent bigger, um, literally bigger the solubility product, the more stuff goes into solution. So if you see a really small number for this, you think immediately, really insoluble. And this goes with the general trends. One of the things that World From Dust does, it talks about solubilities. And it takes these and it turns them into general trends um, where we say copper is usually really insoluble, especially in sulfur. If you go to OH, I think I have a few highlighted here. One of the things said in the book, aluminum hydroxide, really insoluble. So it's abundant, but it's really insoluble. Look at its solubility product, 10 to the minus 32. It's complicated a little bit by the fact that we have three OHs, so we have to account for those. But um, at pH 7, those are each about 10 to the minus 7. And so you can actually even calculate what the approximate, at pH 7 water, what would the aluminum uh, hydroxide concentration be. And it would be 10 to the minus 32. You take away 10 to the minus 21 from this cubed. And what would that be? It would still be 10 to the minus 10. So aluminum hydroxide would only be 10 to the minus 10 molar at pH 7 stuff, at the saturated point. That's where you have as much in solution as you're going to possibly get. Cadmium sulfide, we already, um, we already talked about those other ones. We can compare that to cobalt sulfide and copper sulfide. And we can compare that to zinc sulfide as well. So all the sulfides are really nice because they're exactly the same. They have um, their plus two uh, 
cations with minus two anions. And you can compare those directly. You can even say, okay, so which is more soluble, cadmium sulfide or zinc sulfide? They're pretty close because you, you can compare them though because they are directly comparable. So the zinc has the, the um, smaller negative exponent, which means it's the bigger number. The one with the bigger number is the um, more soluble stuff. And so there's our iron hydroxide, which we can compare to iron. Uh, but the, here's another comparison that we can do directly. Iron 2 hydroxide and iron 3 hydroxide, we have to correct for the hydroxide being multiplied again. But still, this, if, even after you correct for that, you'll see that this number, is, is a, this is a lot more soluble than that. And it's one of the things that we said, iron 3 is a lot less soluble than iron 2. And this is what RJP Williams was arguing about. Um, there are some arguments about calcium as well. But you get the idea. So RJP Williams did things where he compared the different things and he like the, compared the solubility constants for all these different things for the hydroxide versus the sulfide. And you can see that you have a trend where you have the hydroxide is, um, is actually, so this is the negative log of the solubility product. So up here means more insoluble. Down here means more soluble. Okay? Uh, and you can see that for magnesium, the, um, the and the, oh, I got to make sure that I get the right ones. The solid line is the sulfide, and the oxide is the dashed line. Is that correct? Sulfide is the solid line, yes. Hydroxide is the dashed line. Here, the sulfide is actually more soluble for magnesium. For manganese, they're about the same. And then for pretty much everything else, the sulfide is less soluble. But for copper, it's super less soluble. For iron, it's only a little less soluble. So here, here's one of the reasons why you had the thing when oxygen came in, sulfide went away, copper got a lot more soluble. Still less soluble, but it got a lot more soluble. And that's where the argument comes in. This is where you can see a trend and you can see basically as you go throughout the periodic table, the stuff on the right gets more soluble, um, gets more, much more soluble when oxygen comes on the picture. So that makes the difference between these guys, which are pretty much old elements, and these ones, which are newer elements. And this is the yellow circle with high amounts of sulfur that keeps the cobalt, copper, and zinc especially out of the ocean. Especially the copper and especially the, the stuff over here. The cobalt's actually closer to the middle. And the red circle would, when oxygen increased, you would actually have these things precipitate more. And the big one here is iron will precipitate more when oxygen increases. Okay. 